Back in January of this year, when it was still cold in the wintertime, my girlfriend's family and I decided to have a weekend bonfire where we set out, cooked some barbecue chicken, and sat around the fire. Well, after the night grew weary, and my girlfriend's mom and dad and brother all retired to bed, it was just my girl and I, sitting out by the fire, kissing, talking, and just staring off into the night. It was incredibly peaceful, and wonderful to every degree. Until we heard a horrible, horrible roar that shook us both. This roar is far off in the canyon. On the back side of my girlfriend's father's house is a very, very large canyon that has woods separating the backyard from that canyon. Whatever this roar came from, it didn't sound like any animal I've ever heard of or I would want to meet. And not only was it loud, but it was incredibly deep. It had such low vibrations. You know how like if you've ever played bass and you're playing it through an amp and when you pluck a note, you could feel the vibrations hitting your body. It was kind of like that. Whatever animal made this sound had to have been of enormous size. And for it to carry out in the canyon like that, the way it did, for as long as it did, disturbed me and my girlfriend. That's another thing. The howl or roar lasted 10 to 15 seconds. It was incredibly loud. It did scare me, but it scared my girlfriend far more, to the point she was shaking, got up, put the fire out, and told me to come on, we're going in the house. And in the house we went. I wasn't going to argue with her. It freaked me out too. I was worried that whatever it was was going to come up this way, attracted by the only light surrounding the area, a fire. I'm glad we got out of there, and I didn't have to see what made this noise. At the time, it seemed like any typical disturbance of my cattle. Something had spooked them, and they were running, and mooing, and carrying on. So I grabbed my shotgun, and went outside to take a peek. Come to find out, that it was much more than a simple matter of them being spooked. I came across a few of my cows lying on the ground, bleeding out. So that's when I began moving with a purpose, if you get me. Even when it comes to predators like wolves, an adult cow can hold its own pretty well, unless it's sick or injured. So, my mind was working to figure out what could have gotten the best of some of my cows so quickly. I didn't have the time to perform autopsies. I rushed out to where the action was. My small herd was cowering from what looked to be a man. I yelled to it that I was armed and dangerous, and it didn't seem to hear. So I tried to get an angle where none of my cows would take any of the buckshot. Walking around the thing as it was lunging at my cows got me a full picture of what it was that I was exactly up against, and it wasn't pretty. It was just like the pictures you see in some of the pyramids, the ones with the dog god thing. It just wasn't wearing fancy clothes. But it looked every bit like the pointy-faced black dog that walked around on two legs. I think they call it Anubis, but I could be wrong. It appeared to have that really sleek and pointed snout and muzzle. The eyes were wide open and clearly flushed with adrenaline. It slashed at my cows with claws that were very long. I almost wondered how it avoided cutting itself. I finally got to an angle where I could take a shot and see what would happen. The cloud of shot pelted the monster, and fur blew away in a small cloud of blood. That's when I had its attention. Narrow as the head seemed to be, the teeth were long, and I could see just how long because it bared them at me in a special shade of anger. Despite the shock of the wound, it tried to charge me. So, 
I let it have it with the other barrel. That should cut deep enough that I could see chinks of bone peeking out. It kept howling, in a horrible pain, but just kept coming. I was doing a number. I still had time to chamber another two shells and let them go. The volley shredded most of the meat off of its head. And somehow, the thing kept staggering towards me. I chambered two more shells, and ladies and gentlemen, that was all she wrote. Thing was, after that shot, there wasn't anything left to share with the press. I had a skeletal mass of pulp and vaporized tissue. If I reported this, there was a solid chance that it could be misconstrued as a human body. Then, who would look after my cows? I could be facing some serious prison time, and nothing I could say would change that. So, I more or less took the loss of my cows for the sake of my personal freedom. I try to use the slain as much as possible, but there's only so much beef a farming family can eat. Anyway, that's my story. You're free to use it if you'd like. I live outside the incredibly small town of Weaverville in Northern California. Basically, I live in the sticks, and I believe I saw something, some kind of animal, some creature, that I'm not quite sure what it is. I can't explain it, but the only description I can give you is that it resembled that of a Great Dane, except standing up on two legs. The only connection I have is when I grew up, I was very close to my aunt. She always had two Great Danes with her. My entire upbringing, any time the pair would die or one would die, she would buy another. It was very odd, so that's always stuck out to me. And what I saw that night closely resembled that exactly of a Great Dane. In fact, I even suspected it at first and was wondering how weird it was that it was walking around. But on closer inspection, even though it was as large and as tall and lanky, it resembled more of a coyote from what I could tell. Very, very slender. Its legs were a little more muscular than that of a dog's, but still had the hawks and everything. It stared at me from the wood line, kind of glowing red orbs of eyes, but not like monster red. They were just a warm red glow, an unnatural glow at anything. I wasn't really afraid as much as I was confused. It seemed to be watching me very nervously, like it had got caught doing something and was waiting for me to leave. I don't know. It doesn't really make sense, but that's the vibe I got from it. At the time, I was in my backyard, splitting firewood, when I happened to look up and see this thing staring at me. My backyard isn't the largest, but those trees go on for quite a while. I want to say another five, six miles. I could be way off, but I know it's a ways back there. I've only seen this animal once, and this was about three months ago, right in the height of summer. I have never seen it since, nor heard of it. I have no idea what it could be. From what I know, it could possibly be some sort of rabid wild dog, although I've never heard of rabid wild dogs around here and by themselves, and especially ones that look like Coyote Great Danes. Hi, what lurks beneath? Absolutely love your channel. And a close friend of mine actually has their own horrifying war story to share that somehow involves these dogmen. I had them type it up and send it to me. And they've given me their full permission for me to send this to you and you to read it. So, feel free to read it to your audience if you'd like. Anyway, I've copied and pasted this story in, so here you go. My battalion was pushing into Al-Qaeda stronghold, which was a little more than a few city blocks of super thick buildings. It was no fortress, but the tactics they used 
could try the nerves of any soldier. More than once, I saw my men charged by children that had explosives strapped to their backs. If they ran back where they came from, they'd be shot by their captors. If they ran towards my men, they had to decide if they could live with sacrificing a child for the lives of their fellow soldiers. It was a dire time, and I wouldn't wish it on anyone. The further we pushed into the stronghold, the more we got to see just how old the quarter of the city was. It seemed to be so old that it was mostly uninhabited, and not just due to the occupation by this group. We managed to get by what we had thought was an established perimeter. We found it completely left open, with no security whatsoever. Very sloppy compared to what we usually got from them. We went down a dark alleyway that was so narrow that we had to proceed in single file. That put us at a disadvantage tactically, but what else were we going to do? We were used to hearing voices rattling off something in, say, a language we didn't recognize. Instead, we heard something different that actually got us and made our skin crawl. It sounded like a howling noise, followed by a snarling, and then a yelping or a barking. It sounded nothing like people and everything like animals. The flashlights on our M16s showed us that we were in a courtyard where a dried up fountain stood in the center. There was a sculpture in the fountain and it didn't make sense at the time. But looking back, I am chilled by the memory even further. It was a woman with the head of a dog. We had no idea that it was a bit of foreshadowing of what was to come. We soon saw movement Bodies were crawling down over walls and leaping from windows into the courtyard with us. We were too tactically engaged to notice they weren't human. Bear-sized bodies with the shapes of drooling, snarling wolves became more and more evident. It was like a badly written sequel to Teen Wolf with unlimited stunt doubles. The mission parameters instantly narrowed to preserving the detachment we opened fire on the monsters, and they didn't exactly melt at the touch of live ammunition. They did eventually die, but it was more like they were succumbing to bee stings than bullets. They were able to absorb a ridiculous amount of gunfire before they refused to move anymore. It's rumored that the Iraq war might have ended sooner if we hadn't been pushed back so hard. But in this instance, these weren't terrorists. These were animals, and they were unusually tough. The reports connected to that mission were never released, especially publicly. The U.S. would never gracefully accept a report that her troops were pushed back by wild animals during a key mission. Most of our internal commanders didn't accept it either. Anyway, that's my story. So there you go. There's the story that I had him tell me and write down and send to me. I know the guy personally. Very honest, hardworking. Has done multiple tours over to Iraq. I don't know the exact number, but I'm pretty sure it's like three, four, or maybe five. He's got his experience. Anyway, I hope this is at least interesting. Have a good day. Hi, my name's Roy, and I have a story to tell you from my childhood. So, I grew up with an older brother. At the time of the story, I was seven, and he was nine. We used to play all the time in the spring and summer in a very large patch of woods directly behind our house. We spent hours and hours back there playing together, playing swords with sticks, building tree forts, pretending to start fires, cops and robbers, you name it. We spent hours exploring, looking at bugs, trying to find buried treasure, like any kids do. You know, all the stuff 
we tried to spend the majority of our free time outside when we could, mainly because inside offered us no entertainment. My parents didn't have any TVs, no game systems, nothing. We had a few books here and there, but nothing my brother and I were interested in. So we try and spend all of our time outside and live like real kids do. But that changed halfway during a summer when I was seven and he was nine. We were out playing, and I remember we had a game of hide and go seek. Well, I was it, and so I counted to 50. This time, before I could even finish counting, he comes back running, screaming all the way back to the house. It completely caught me off guard and by surprise. Then, I thought he was pranking me or trying to joke with me, and so I laughed and ran after him. But he was just bawling hysterically, crying, screaming, running to the back door. I chased after him and tried to get him to slow down, but he didn't. He didn't even acknowledge me. He was in a total state of shock and fear. When he got to the back door, I finally caught up with him. My mother was busy doing something, so it took her a minute, if not more, to get to the back door. She usually kept it locked. I had never seen my brother in my life so overtaken by a pure raw emotion as that is fear. It wasn't until a little later, even my mom was freaked out, that she was able to fully get him calmed down. But it was days before he would tell any of us what exactly happened. He just kind of said he saw something, but we really couldn't get anything out of him. Then, days after that, he told me what it is that he saw. It had been about a week, and he asked me if I could keep a secret, and I told him yes. Even more so, being only seven years of age, you want to do anything to be by your brother, and him and I are very close, still. So he told me that he saw a real-life werewolf as he ran to hide. It was walking up to him from behind the tree, reaching out to grab him, from what he said. He said it was big and hairy, covered in dark black fur, with huge fangs and large eyes and ears. It scared him so bad that he ran away. He was pretty serious about it too. He was very shaken up about it, retelling the story at nine years of age. Plus, he had no desire to go back and play in the woods for the rest of the year, which was a huge loss for both of us. So we just kind of stayed inside and were bored the rest of the summer. Now that we're older, and both in our later 20s, I'll ask him about it sometimes. And he basically just tells me what I told you already. That he believes he saw some sort of creature that resembled the werewolves. He's pretty firm on his belief that vampires, mummies, werewolves, those don't exist. But there can be animals out there that have the same resemblance as made-up Hollywood creatures. I mean, that's a lot more plausible than the idea of an actual werewolf existing. So, as he went on to describe it to the T, basically said exactly what he did when he was nine. It stood up on two legs, covered in dark black fur. He said it was really thick, kind of like a shaggy dog, long and gangly and very unkempt like it had been rolling around in dirt and filth and muck. And he said its face was somewhere of a cross between a German shepherd and a wolf. A very pronounced brow ridge, kind of like some monkeys do. And very, very long ears that were very pointed and a long muzzle and huge, sharp canines. This thing was walking towards him, extending both of its arms like it was going to grab him. But it made no effort to run after him or move any faster than a casual slow pace, even after he started running. The whole thing is weird, he tells me, but it is what it is. The following spring and summer, we continued to play back in those woods, and never had any problems afterwards. We moved out of that house and all the way across town when we were 15 and 13, right around high school age. Anyway, that's my story or I should say my brother's story. I never saw or heard or seen anything.
I was forcing myself to go camping because I was out of shape at the time, and I knew that if I did not develop a taste for fresh air and something like exercise, I was going to have a miserable last stretch of my existence. I'm also kind of a hypochondriac, and I'm only 36. Several of my friends got a camping trip together for old times' sake. Old times that I were never a part of, because I was far too afraid of the outdoors. So, I went along. It didn't do too bad, except I couldn't stand to be far away from anyone for too long. There was something about being by myself outdoors that made me feel exposed and uncomfortable. I think my friends took turns pawning me off onto each other, as if they were some collective group of babysitters. I had a breakthrough when I was moved to stand and stare at a pond that we discovered at the campsite. For a moment, I forgot about being afraid, and I forgot about being alone. Bad part was, when I finally started paying attention to what was around me, I found that I was alone. That's when the first wave of panic hit me. I frantically looked around for somebody, anybody that would be nearby. I heard some movement in a nearby cluster of trees, and I was pretty sure that my friends couldn't have gone very far. Nor did I think it likely that they would deliberately abandon me, considering my mental state. I didn't stop to think about the possibility that it could be somebody that I didn't know, or a bear, or worse. It was worse. It turned around in time to look at me, and I think for a half second, we both wore the same expression of confusion. This thing walked on two legs, but was no human being. It looked down at me from a very thick bear-like neck and head that was plunged onto hunched huge shoulders. The face resembled somebody trying to crossbreed a dog with a pig. Some of its teeth protruded like tusks, but it had the black nose and a smashed face of a hog. The ears were weird as well. They were very long and very rough looking, like they were torn apart. I'm sorry, that probably doesn't make any sense. They were kind of gross. I picked a random direction and I just ran. I thought it was running behind me, but I couldn't tell the sounds of my footsteps from it. My friend has no trouble finding me as much as the screaming as I was doing. They say that I was screaming something about a giant dog. Evidently, they didn't see what had been behind me. I asked them about it and none of them saw anything. Perhaps the thing was just as startled by me as I was of it but I know nothing of what I saw. I'm merely only guessing, and I thought it would be best if I reached out to you, since you seem to have answers and know exactly what these people deal with. Based on the descriptions that I gave you, what is it that you think I saw? I was just a kid myself. The first time my little sister told me about her pet, we all presumed it was just some imaginary playmate that she had created, since we weren't allowed pets in the apartment complex. She talked for hours about Doggy, and how she only saw him at nighttime, and that he was her special friend. She took it quite far as well, starting to sneak bits of food out of the fridge, or save bits of her supper to take out to him. We lived in a second floor apartment, and although she wasn't allowed to go down into a shared yard where it was dark, our mom had a small balcony from her bedroom. So, she'd go there to see Doggy and give him his treat. Sometimes I'd ask if I could come see him too, and she'd shake her head no. Doggy won't come if he sees anybody else, she'd tell me. So serious and solemnly, it was almost compelling this went on for years. Sometimes, 
there would be a complaint about some dirt having been kicked up in the yard or the trash cans knocked over. One time, there were even scratch marks on the outside of the balcony, and again, Doggy got the blame. In the end, I had to know. I knew there couldn't be any way in hell that my little sister actually had a dog that only manifested at nighttime and was somehow big enough to reach our second floor balcony. It was absolutely 100% impossible. I also knew that she wouldn't let me go and see Doggy, so I just have to sneak. So that evening, after supper, I clutched my belly and said I needed a visit to the bathroom. I might be a while. I remember seeing her pocket a sausage from her plate, so I knew she was going straight out whilst mom cleared dishes. I shot out of the room, but instead of the bathroom, I raced into my mom's bedroom and hid in the closet. Then I waited. Sure enough, moments after, I heard her come in and slide open the balcony door. Then I heard her. As quietly as I could, I opened the door. I remember thinking at that point, my sister should get into performance art as the panting and snuffling noises coming from the balcony sounded very realistic. Then, I saw it. Doggy. I don't know how tall it was, whether it was standing on something or strong enough to have climbed up and to hang onto the railing, but I could clearly see its face in the shadows, thanks to the security light. It was definitely some kind of dog, but unlike anything I had ever seen. It was slightly obscured by the railings, but I can make out that it was eating the leftover sausage with one of its hands, because this dog had long arms and hands kind of like a person, but a definite dog head and face and had yellow, dull glowing eyes. Staring at my sister, I was frozen in terror. This dog thing looked like something that had been released straight from hell. Yet she didn't seem one bit afraid. She had reached through the railing and even tried to pat it. It honestly could have killed her in an instant. I could see the veins and muscles throbbing through its giant hair. But instead, looked at her. Leaning over the railing, she said bye to her pet and said see you later. And just like that, she walked back out of her mom's room, not noticing me. I waited for another moment, and then, overcoming my fear, I tiptoed out of the balcony and peered over the railings. I heard a low growl that made my stomach turn to water, and I could tell you that I really did need the bathroom then. The next evening after supper, she came back to the table after going out to see this thing, what she called Doggy, with a look of disappointment. He wasn't there. Mom had ruffled her hair, had said not to worry, but he never came back. Whether it was a coincidence or whether that growl was a message that he'd been betrayed or something, I don't know. But we never had another visit and my sister never talked about it again. I've even tried to get her to mention it and she somehow knows no idea what I'm talking about. But I know what I saw Sometimes I have to remind myself that monsters are indeed real. I feel like I'm living in a Goosebumps book sometimes. I think the only reason that this creature was even coming around was basically because my sister was feeding it, and quite well. She would bring a lot of food out there. It wasn't just like scraps or half a sandwich. It was a lot. This thing never acted friendly in a traditional pet sense but it did act neutral. Again, if you're offering something a food source, it makes sense that it's going to lure it in. I'm just surprised it didn't take her for whatever reason. A few months ago, I decided to do some urban exploring. It's something that I had been really interested in for a while, 
but just hadn't gotten around to actually doing anything about it. I'd gotten as far as buying a kit for it, and doing the investigation. You know, surveying a spot, checking for security. I just hadn't had the right prerequisite kick up the butt to get up and actually doing it. Then, I had a massive fight with my then-girlfriend, in which not only did she dump me, but was also quite cutting in her remarks. That was my catalyst. So, off I went. Only, things didn't quite turn out as planned, as they never do. Being a bit of a horror buff, one of the criteria was when I was selecting the location of my first urbex, was the likelihood of it being haunted. The prospect of actually seeing a ghost and catching it on camera, and then of course, putting it on a specially created YouTube channel in which it goes viral and makes me famous, would be just what I needed to shove in my ex's face. So, an abandoned school seems so ripe for the potential for creepy ghost kids. Plus, there was some urban legend attached that suggested the old headmaster had hung himself, which is why it was now derelict. I couldn't find anything to validate that, but it was good enough to go on. Man, I was psyched. I really wanted to see something. And they do say that you can will stuff to appear, if you believe. That apparitions are far more likely to manifest to a believer. So, I was armed with a camera that had a decent night vision mode and off I went. Now, it is all very well planning these things. You can read about it. You can hear people talking about it. You can even see it on various websites. But actually, being there in the middle of the night, all on your own, is quite different. And I'm not afraid to admit that it was certainly unnerving at the very least. Yes, I was excited, but I was also bricking it. I could feel malevolence oozing from every corner, but I forced myself to keep going and not turn around and flee, unlike some sort of chicken. Further in I went, I'm not exaggerating to say it, that it absolutely stank in there, like wet dog and years and years of mud but it smelled like every local animal that had used it as a toilet, especially dog urine, especially. I had to keep the light pointed at the floor most of the time, just to avoid piles of fecal matter. And it was rank. I'd just go about into the furthest accessible point when I heard a growl. This is in England, by the way. We don't have wolves, or bears, or mountain lions. There's not a lot of animal life that can really hurt you, especially if you're a full-grown man. At most, it might be a fox who, although I wouldn't want to nip me, would likely be frightened off by the light right in its furry little face. Then I heard it again. I've never actually heard a fox growl. I've seen them sniffling around the bins, and I know that a vixen makes a god-awful racket when she's in season but I have yet to hear anything growl like this. Your mind does crazy things when you're on hyper alert, and I started to question the last time there had been a wolf sighting in the southwest of England, despite knowing it had likely been well over a hundred years, telling myself that it had to be some sort of dog that had run away from home and was probably threatened thinking I was challenging him for the rat supply. I shone my light over in the general direction of the noise, and I kid you not, I very nearly added to those piles of crap all over the ground. Over in the corner, what would at first I thought might have been a werewolf, that was honestly the first thing my mind went to, but since it wasn't racing at me with its claws and jaws out, ready to eviscerate me, I inferred that it wasn't going to kill me just yet anyway. And that reasoning allowed me just a little bravery or stupidity, whichever you feel is most applicable, and I took a second look. This thing was huge. 
It was taller than I, and definitely more broad. It looked to be made of pure muscle, except I could quite see it as covered in dark matted fur. It had long legs and arms just like a person, which had made me originally jump to the werewolf theory. But getting a second look, I could see the head was not wolf-like, although it had been an easy mistake to make when it's dark. It was more like a dog, kind of like a German shepherd. And that is when it really sank in. Even if this wasn't about to be Dog Soldiers Part 2, there was still a freaking massive dog person in the same room as I was. That's when it let out a low guttural growl, and that was enough for me. I legged it, ran as fast as I could. I didn't give a crap about filming or documenting anything. I just wanted to make it out alive. I have no real idea exactly what I saw down there. I went in hoping to see orbs, or feel cold, or something spooky. But whatever the hell that was, whatever creature that was, it wasn't a ghost or supernatural. It was very real, and I will never be returning to that spot. I have no answers for what animal I have witnessed that night. I have you for what I think is a dogman story, although we are still not 100% sure. I'll tell you my story anyway, and let you decide for yourself what you think, since you seem to be an expert on the topic. It actually even sounds like some sort of urban legend as I tell it, but I promise you, this is true. My boyfriend and I both come from fairly religious backgrounds, with very strict parents, and even stricter rules about being in the house together. Doors open at all times kind of stuff, which is all well and good, as we respect our family. But when you're 17 and want to be together, you need to be inventive. So it was back to old-fashioned parking, finding a secluded lane somewhere we wouldn't get busted by anybody nosy neighbors, cops, so we could enjoy ourselves in peace. We were both into scary stuff, and had even joked about the Texarkana stuff, where the hook man decided to prey on the Lover's Lane couples. I hope the hook man doesn't come. We'd be joking before getting the windows hot. Then one night, something happened. Only this time, the thing that came didn't have a hook. We found what we had thought was a perfect spot to be alone. An old country road, surrounded by thick woodland that didn't really seem to go anywhere. It was unlikely anybody would use it, unless they actually wanted to park up here. We'd been coming up here for a couple of weeks, and so far, the only slight interruption we'd had was barking, which we assumed was coming from one of the nearby farms, which were far for us but close enough that on a still night, you could hear them. A few times, they seemed to be really going mad. There was so much barking, it almost put us off. This time, however, the barking and now growling seemed a hell of a lot closer than normal. Of course, even though I mentioned this, my boyfriend was adamant that no dog was going to stop us. He even seemed a little jumpy, when we had heard a bark that must have come from the woods, not as far from the farm, but he was still insistent. Even if there was a dog running around in the trees, it wasn't going to do nothing to us. Well, I wish I'd have the good sense to listen to my own senses, as lo and behold, just a few moments after that barking that already sounded way too close for comfort came growling. A low and tense, and way, way too close for the car growling. Followed swiftly by a scratching noise on the side of the vehicle. I was beginning to scream. I honest to God thought that the actual real hook man was out there, and he was going to rip open the car and gut us. What else would be making that noise? My boyfriend began panicking and did the only thing he could think of in the moment. 
he turned the headlight on full beam and hit the horn. I don't know if it was the sudden shock of the light, the sudden blast of the horn, or both, but the thing outside that was making the growling and scratching noises froze outside of the driver's side window for just a second, but that was long enough for us to see what it was. It was as tall as the car, and broad like a wrestler, covered in hair. It stood up on two legs like a person, and was really hairy. This wasn't a person though. It very clearly had an animal head. A dog had to be precise. It kind of reminded me of one of those dogs from the canine units the police use. I don't know what breed of dog it is. He looked right at us through the window and turned around and casually left. When I say he took off, I mean he was there one second and gone in the next. It was like he's faster than any Olympic runner. My boyfriend quickly jumped in the seat and hit the gas and we were out of there still barely clothed. He called me the following morning to say he'd been out to check the side of his car, just to see what damage there was now that it was daylight. He said in the side of his car were four real deep indented scratches, looking like a damn bear or wolf had tried to gouge out the panel. I still don't know exactly what we saw. Parts of me want to think it was some kind of hellhound sent us to stop from fornicating. But that's just my religious upbringing. The rational side of me has honestly no clue. I saw it close enough that I can confirm it was for sure not somebody in some costume. But the side that spent hours driving down the YouTube wormhole makes me think it might have been something more evil. I work in security in this very well-to-do neighborhood. It's a pretty good gig, but to be honest, not a lot happens. And although the houses are large and no doubt full of valuables, any would-be burglar would have been crazy to attempt a break-in. These rich people got top-of-the-line CCTV, motion lights, alarms. They're inside some probably armed to the teeth, rigged up to 911. So most of the time, I just drive around, waving at people and checking that delivery drivers move off quickly. Then, one night, I get a call from one of my favorites saying her backyard light keeps coming on and there looks to be a strange dog trying to get in the house. She had chihuahuas, I guess, and I'm guessing Whatever was sniffing around outside the fence knew that. She instructed to bring a big gun and told me it's a big dog. I'm not really afraid of dogs. I always fancied a detail with a canine unit. But I ain't stupid. I might not be afraid, but that don't mean I'm going to head over there with the intentions of petting this thing. Huge dogs did not sound like something I wanted to be around more than I had to. So, I wandered on over, big gun and big flashlight in hand. I sneak around to the back of the property where she said she could see the creature or dog via the security light. I whistled, calling it over and hoping it wasn't actually that big, that it would just be some dog I could take to the pound and get on with my night. Maybe it was one of the neighbor's loose dogs. I could hear some rustling and a growl. Not the best sign. I pulled out some sausages and still trying with a flashlight. And then my eyes saw this thing for what it was. The lady had been correct when she said this was a big dog. It was nearly larger than me. Not really taller, but skinny and very mangy looking. It also stood upright like a person, panting, with very heavy labored breathing. Its head and face very much so reminded me of a jackal. I yelled, grabbed the gun, intending to shoot it when it ran. I've never seen anything move that fast before. 
I gave a little chase, but I couldn't even tell in which direction it had gone. I spent the whole night looking, trying to figure out what it was. Anyway, that's my latest and greatest encounter. I was playing Nerf guns with my older brother back when I was a little kid. I was far too little at the time to know that he wasn't coming to get me when I was hiding behind a rock for too long. He was using it as a chance to get rid of me so he could go back to playing video games, tricking me into playing Nerf Wars with him, waiting for me to hide, and shooting at me just enough so I would. And then as I waited for him, one turn, I went deeper into the woods behind our house and waited even more for him to show himself. I must have been one of those children with superhuman patience because I sat there waiting until the sun was starting to go down. Only then did I get it through my thick skull that he wasn't coming and I needed to get home. My path was intercepted by an animal that was walking on two legs instead of four. This scared me. It wasn't looking at me but it was sniffing the air every few steps it took. Looking back, it had an exaggerated oversized head with the general features of a Doberman pincher. That is, if the fur were more wild and the markings less distinct. It was all teeth and claws, and I thought better of distracting it. I told my brother about it when I got home, of course, after chastising him for not coming home after me. He turned pale at the word of the story, but nobody else really believed me. He did, though. I wondered about that for a very long time. He did confess later on, much later when I was older, that he had run across the same towering dog-like beast. When he heard that I had encountered it, he was hit by a pang of guilt and thought it was incredibly fortunate that I was still alive. I've done my own homework now that I'm older, and apparently, it's not unusual for this humanoid dog to spare the lives of humans. Still, it's a chance I'd rather not take. Normally, I'm not a believer in what I'd call fictitious fairy tales like werewolves, vampires, and such. But I will acknowledge when I find proof of the existence of unknown animals that I didn't previously believe in. I've spent a lot of my time in the Sierra Nevada mountain range, exploring and looking for caves to dive into. I've camped out there many times. I've heard all sorts of wild, hairy tales things that will make your skin crawl. I, too, have found evidence to believe that there might be a predator at large that's far more potent than your typical mountain lion or black bear. I've come to find evidence of what I would best support the hypothesis that there is indeed a large alpha predator, more likely a wolf that dominates much of the range on this mountain. I've heard stories where people talk about seeing bright lights, or even Bigfoot, I can't confirm nor deny any of that. I myself have had zero experiences with all of that. What I can confirm is the things that I know I have found that I cannot explain, and evidence that would point to a large, upright walking predatory wolf. The first major player in the evidence that I've mustered is finding large canid prints in multiple spots on my trek. There's one major component to these tracks and it's that they don't adhere to your standard wolf size tracks. Your standard wolf track, on average, is around 4 inches in width and height. These that I've found are easily doubled, if not a little larger than double, and the indent is very visibly noticeable. This leans toward the fact that whatever large canine made this is not only larger, but much heavier due to a deeper indent into the soil. Here's where things get even hairier. They don't follow your typical quadrupedal pattern that a dog or a wolf would follow. They are bipedal by the pattern, following a two-step pattern with a four to five foot stride. 
massive strides. Does this support that there is some sort of large upright walking wolf around these parts? I am not sure myself, although the evidence I've found seems to strongly show support of that for my findings. The real kicker to it all is I have found four to five sets in total of these same large canid bipedal style footprints throughout my time out here, all in varying locations and different spots. I struggle with the concept because I believe that if a wolf was to walk bipedally, it would walk like a bear in the sense where they only walk for a short distance. But the longest stretch of tracks I found went on for well over 15 feet. All of these tracks were much in the same with indentation into the dirt, size, stride, and stepping pattern. It's possible that there could be a large pack of wolves out there that have grown to an abnormal size, learning to walk bipedally for short distances at a time. I have never found sets of tracks where it's more than just one. These are all just singular wolves that I've found on my time out. That is just one, what I like to call set of evidence, if you will. Now, I'm not saying what I'm about to tell you is necessarily evidence leaning towards my hypothesis, but it makes you wonder what's going on. What's killing these animals in the way they're being killed? I have discovered multiple deer and two black bears on account, dead. To dive into details a little more, I'm going to discuss with you the black bear deaths. Black bears do inhibit these mountain ranges, and although I don't see them as much, I do know they are here. I respect their space and that this is their home. To my knowledge and understanding, black bears don't have any predators that are above them. They don't have to worry about being killed due to them being omnivores, and their size and stature alone is enough to ward away mountain lions, for example. I'm sure a mountain lion and a bear have gotten into it before in nature, but I wouldn't put it past me, but I don't believe that is how these two black bear that I found were killed. I had come to almost a small valley where there is more tree coverage and lots of rock. Great as a protective enclosure with a small little cavern-like den. I had stumbled upon an actual black bear den. If I hadn't traveled down a 50 feet steep rocky incline of this hill into this little pocket of an area, I wouldn't have found what I did. Outside this small bear den, I know it was because I did check out the den after finding these bears, I discovered the cadavers of what looked to be two deceased black bears. The manner in which these black bears were killed was gruesome, to say the least. Both bears were within 10 feet of each other, killed by an unknown and unforeseen predator. The larger black bear, what I believe to be a male, but I didn't check, only judging by its size, had its head completely torn off its body. There was no head to be found anywhere around the area or visible vicinity that I was in. All along its body, was large, deep gashes that looked to come from claws of great size. It was a bloody mess. Although the blood was coagulated, you could tell whatever happened that this bear suffered severe damage. The other bear, which lay no more than 10 feet away from the other bear, appeared to be smaller in size and frame. My guess was a female. As with the first, I didn't think in the moment to check the genitalia. The similarities and damage to this were mainly the deep gash wounds all over its body. It made me think of grizzly bear gashes, how they're so long and run so deep. These bears' body were shredded. The claw pattern wasn't even that of a bear though. It was different. If we're being honest, the flesh was far too mangled to get an accurate look as to what any claw pattern was exactly. The difference between the two bear is that this one was smaller, had its entire throat torn out. There was a lot of dried blood around it. Both of these bears had just died within the last day, judging by the freshness of the kill, so they were still rather fresh. Had I not wandered down into this area, I wouldn't have caught this grisly scene. Sorry about the pun, I just wanted to shed some light into a bleak scenario. The smell of decay hadn't even hit me until I wandered into here. The tree coverage and enclosure was so thick with rocks, it was almost encasing this area loosely, if that makes sense. 
I can see why it made for the perfect den spot. Anyhow, after spending maybe a few moments observing these dead bear and looking for any clues, I found bits of long, stringy black hair. This hair did not belong to the bears, but something else. I found it in small clumps and random sizes around the general radius of, I'd say 20 feet around us if I had to guess. The dirt beneath our feet was disturbed. I could see there were tracks of both bear and another animal, but I couldn't make out anything distinct. There had been too much ruffled dirt. It was clear there was some sort of fight, a struggle, and something, some form of mountain predator, tore these bears to shreds, ripped off the head of one, and tore the throat out of another. Last I checked, mountain lions don't kill like this, especially not two black bears. Their claw size also wasn't capable of making the gashes that I saw. These were huge. The entire scene of this upset me so much, I had to get out of there and fast. I figured whatever did this to these bears was still close enough to this area. So, I'm left with the question, what does that to a black bear? I always thought black bears were pretty much never challenged by other animals. I guess I'm wrong. Then I think about large canid tracks that I've seen over the years, and I can't help but put two and two together. I have never seen anything like the black bear seen since then or before. I'm not sure if those tracks have anything to do with what killed those bear, but I speculate it might. If the tracks I found really do belong to some unknown upright walking canid that lives out there, you're talking about a several hundred pound canid predator. Wolves themselves are large, so something more than double its size and bipedal. Now that's scary. Who knows what kind of damage, if exists, this animal could truly be capable of. The last and only other out of place findings I've really had have been deer. I found deer dead in all various ways of being killed, just in the mountains of course, which is the context here, where I primarily spend much of my time. I've seen them with their throats torn out and mangled, which could easily be explained by the current standard predators in the area. Then there are the ones that I find are stranger than fiction. Two ways, actually. The first is I've only found maybe four in total like this, but these deer are ripped to pieces. Quite literally, I mean that. Torn to shreds. Whatever killed it didn't even bother to eat it, only tear it to pieces including its guts and all. Some of them were more disemboweled than the others, but they were generally just ripped apart. The worst one I found was a young deerling, slightly older and larger than just a little fawn. All four legs ripped off its body. The body was ripped in half with intestines spilling. Head and neck were both ripped off and apart. Part of the face was smashed in from the left side, and it looked to be smashed by a large rock to me. This small fawn, like the rest of the other deer I saw that died this way, are found within a small space, no more than 30 feet from each body part. It too was a bloody mess, as all of them are. Of course, my spacing estimates are just guesses, of course. Nothing is ever formulaic. This fawn had to be there for a few days, so it was decaying thoroughly. But surprisingly, there seemed to be no predators that had come and taken the free meal. The fawn didn't even appear to be eaten on, just butchered. Some of the other deer I found were in fresher states of decay, as all the kills I find are usually fresher. Probably because, out there, the bodies can decay so quickly due to climate. The same case was said for the other deer that I had found. Virtually zero signs that they were eaten on by not only what killed them, but anything other than maggots since. There is zero known predators that will kill a deer tear it to pieces this way, and not eat on any of the meat. I see no reason, any logical reason why any predator would waste food in that way, considering it takes time and energy of the predator to take down a prey. Biologically, and by nature's law, it doesn't make sense. It's something I'm still researching and looking into. What animal kills prey aggressively just for the sake of killing? Number two. The other way that I'll find them dead is far more disturbing in my opinion, just because of how unnatural the death itself is. 
I found more like this than I have torn to pieces. These ones die and have random parts of their body cut open, or missing parts of their body, with no signs of blood. In fact, the first doe I found had both of her front legs and right calf and right half of her face gone. They looked to be perfectly cut out, like a fine laser or something. No drop of blood, and the body had begun to mummify under the sun. There were zero signs of decay other than that. No flies, no signs of maggots, not even an odor of death or decay, actually. No signs of predators even coming to check out the cadaver. This doe was probably a week old dead, if I had to guess. It was just lying there in the middle of a small clearing, higher up in elevation. Other deer I found that were killed in this manner have very similar death patterns. Another one I found had its entire neck and head missing. Bigger doe it looked like, but the same as the first. No blood, no signs of decay, or flies or maggots. Not even predators. No smell of rot or death. And the cut, once again, looked surgical in nature. It was extremely clean, not a single imperfection was made. They were so clean that it looked to be man-made. At the elevation I was at, I had no answers for these happenings because I go to areas not others go to. Why would somebody be out here taking pieces of deer? It just doesn't add up to me. That also does not explain the strangeness of it all. No smell, no animal or insect touching the body. It's weird to me. Things just don't die and not give off an odor. All of this paired with the killings of both bears is kind of frightening, to say the least. Adding the deer in, and assuming there's all one big grand connection here, don't mind the conspiracy. This might be some sort of undiscovered, lone canid alpha predator. I'm no stranger to the weirdness that goes on in these mountains, along with many other mountains in the country that are notorious for UFOs, Bigfoot, and other things of that nature. I know the natives out here have many stories about these mountains, as well as a plethora of explorers and hikers alike. However, the things I've told you about are really the only encounters that I put in that category of mysterious. Everything else has just been pure survival in the wilderness. For me, to believe there is something, there needs to be a strong, suited sense of evidence for that something. That's how I've always lived by, and this situation is no exception. I cannot deny the evidence that there is something that is somewhat canid. I have no idea what it is, and others that I have talked to and spoke to don't seem to know or have an idea. Everything I know and have heard points in the direction that it is not an existent animal currently. Then we go back to the deer and the bear situation. That's very unnatural of any predator to do, whether it to be another predator or its prey. Maybe this is all a part of the weird stuff that goes on. I will continue to be vigilant, aware, and respectful of my surroundings of the animals and places around me. This value is held true, especially when I am out in those mountains. I can't say or for a fact what I've pieced together is indeed a real living creature, although it very much so is in my head. But it is definitely evidence that is based on something. What I'm not sure, I can only hope to find those answers as time goes on. This happened to me about a week ago. I live out in a big area that's primarily used for agriculture, so there is seldom houses and lots of long empty roads around here. Because of this, my nearest neighbors are about a quarter mile in both directions. Beyond that, is sparsely spread out neighbors on both sides of the road, with large fields full of varying grains and plants. Between properties and areas of housing, there are large amounts of land for cattle. Think flat plains with a few trees here and there sprinkled in. Because of this, there's not a whole lot of traffic going on on either way of the road. Most of the time, the entire road is dead. It makes it enjoyable for living out here. So, I have a five-month-old son that is in this new sleep phase of his where he needs to be put in the car at night and driven to sleep. Usually, at night, I will put him in his car seat and put him in the car, get in and go for about a 20-minute drive, 
turning around at a certain point and driving him back. This always seems to help him lull him into sleep and works every time I do it. All right, so now that we've got some background info cleared, here's what happened. About a week ago, it was around 10 p.m. at night. It was clear out, decent weather. Not too cold, not too hot. I come out, put my son in the car, and hop in. Pull out of the driveway, and we're on the road driving. If you keep driving down a road, it just continues on straight, with a sharp 90 degree turn that heads south. This road continues only for a few houses on either side, but mostly vast empty farm fields and grasslands that haven't been used. It's pretty barren. On both sides of the road, there is the typical road ditch that you would have, and then there's a small fence. In these ditches and along these fences are very tall grass. I don't know if wheat grass is the correct term for it, maybe just wild grass. It's the tall grass that you see out in the country that reminds me of how wheat looks. It gets very tall along here because it's never cut. This is important, and I'll explain why here in a minute. I need to mention that because we live where we do. Animal and nightlife is very common. Deer are nocturnal by nature, so we see does by the dozen out here all the time. Blacktail, actually. Skunks are commonly seen just as much as raccoons and possums. You'll even see the occasional coyote sometimes, but that's more rare. We have cougars and mountain lions out here since they come down into the valley but I have not personally seen one yet. Deer will sometimes pop out in front of your car at night. Same with other smaller critters. This is just something anybody that lives out here will know about and understand as common sense. I know there's wild animals at night. I just don't know what it is that I saw. I know it was not a deer, plain and simple. Okay, so I'm driving down this road and the road begins to incline slightly. As I'm going up this long, drawn-out, slow incline, I notice the tall grass rustling on my passenger side or right side of the road, and it's caught in my brights. I immediately get ready to brake because I'm thinking it's a deer about to jump out across the road, or maybe a skunk or something, and up stands this dark shape, hyena-looking animal that seemed to stand up on two legs. It was tall, taller than a man, it scared the crap out of me. It all happened so fast within just a few seconds, but I got a look at it. It reflected a dark crimson kind of eye shine because my brights hit its eyes. It stood up out of the tall grass facing my direction. I don't know if it looked directly at my vehicle, but I saw its face. It was very twisted and hyena looking. I wish I could describe it better for you, but I can't. It gave off a really bad vibe that I felt the second I saw it, and it lingered. It was this horrible feeling I felt in the pit of my stomach that just screamed I shouldn't have seen what I did. When I first saw the grass rustling, I had let my foot off the gas, but not pressing the brake. As soon as I saw this, I had about three seconds of shock and, what is that? And then slammed the gas to go. The whole time, trying to rationalize what it is that I saw, and what it could have been. Even though I got to see it from the front, I couldn't see any specific details like what its arms or hands looked like because they were down on its side, but it resembled a very hairy person with an ugly hyena looking head and face. That's what I made out from the few seconds of my brights hitting it through the grass. And then, that evil feeling. Gosh, it's hard for me to type this out without getting chills just thinking about it. I have never just felt that overwhelming sense of evil before. Once you feel it, if you ever have felt it, you'll know. It's uncomfortable. The spot I usually stop to turn around at, I sat there for a minute and hesitated on what to do because I had to turn around to go back home. The exact same road. I didn't want to cross that spot again and see that thing. After sitting there for maybe five minutes, debating with myself, I talked myself into doing it. I was very nervous the entire drive back home, even though it's only a 10 minute drive back. As I drove back through that spot, I didn't see the animal again. I even looked in the same spot I saw it before. It was gone. 
The feeling too was gone, and it didn't seem to be anywhere around that I could visibly see. Anybody out there who's listening will understand where I'm coming from if they've ever had a sighting that's truly frightened them as this did to me. Whether it be something that doesn't exist or a true animal, fear is fear. There's just something far more to this than seeing something that I didn't know what it was. It invoked this awful feeling of fear and dread. I've never had that happen before. I don't think it was a natural animal either. Nothing besides bear will stand up on their hind legs like this did, and it was skinny looking. The face is what still haunts me when I rethink about this encounter. I don't want to dwell on this too much, but thought if I told you about my sighting with whatever this animal is, I could possibly get some answers. What did I see that night? Years ago, I was working as a chemicals operator at a company near the airport here around Huntsville, Alabama. I was scheduled to work a third shift, and I had extra time on my hands before going into work that night. So just before dusk, I went down to a swamp I knew had some good bass and bluegills to try out some new fishing lures I had just bought. Now, mind you, this is in the afternoon hours, and some people were still driving up and down this road, getting home from work, so traffic was pretty frequent. As I stood along the edge of the road in the swamp, casting my lure out, I hear a very large tree snap and crash in the back side of the swamp. I have never heard a tree fall in the woods naturally before, other than someone with a chainsaw cutting it. Then, two minutes later, another tree snapped and crashed close to the same area. Totally not a coincidence, so I am no longer fishing at this point. Instead, I started walking down the edge of the swamp on the road to get a better look into the woods. I couldn't see anything moving or standing, at least as far as I could see anyway. Since the sun was going down behind the swamp, it was very dark in those woods. I started to hear something running towards me. I wasn't scared because I could tell it had to be small running my way. Then, out of the thicket of the woods came a red fox running straight at me and passed by me by about two feet, crossing the road, not even looking for cars or anything. It was completely scared out of its mind like something was hunting it. I turned back towards the swamp that this fox had ran from, and I could smell it. The smell of a wet, dead goat that had been rotting in the hot summer sun for about a week. It was god-awful, too. I got that eerie feeling that I should leave, so that's exactly what I did. To this day, I've never gone into those woods to investigate what made me feel that way. I know that foxes don't normally run toward people, but that fox was scared of something in those woods and it didn't give a damn about me or heavy traffic. No, I didn't see a Bigfoot or a Dogman, but then again, I have never seen a Black Panther either, and I know they are real. Two trees falling, fox running by my legs, that horrible smell and that eerie feeling. Too much to be a coincidence for me. I took my cousins out for a night stroll out this last month. Some backstory. Usually every May, a lot of my family will go out to my wife's cousin's house, which has tons and tons of woods surrounding it. It's very peaceful. Every May, a lot of us cousins will go, see each other, and have tons of food and hang out for a few days at a time. Think like a big Christmas get together, but instead it's in May. This time, we decided at night to do some night hiking around these parts to explore and to see what we could see. My wife's cousin has great sets of high-powered flashlights. They're the rather expensive kind, but they work great. They have multiples of them, so I decided to take a few of the little ones out with me. So it was me and my three little ones, aged 8 to 13. So maybe not little ones, but they're still just kids. The entire time we're walking around, we aren't seeing a whole lot of anything. Mainly just deer from time to time, and that's about it. They were terrified that a cougar was going to get us, because cougars are nocturnal hunters. But I kept them calm, letting them know that we were making too much noise to draw in a cougar and would scare it away. 
That's when they decided it would be the best idea to travel into even thicker woods where the underfooting wasn't as safe due to unseen rocks and brush. At the time, I wasn't aware of that, so I said of course. Being in the moment and not wanting to disappoint them. I feel like bravery got the best of all of us as we traveled into the thicker and thicker dense parts of the forest. It was quiet, but I had noticed that there had been no crickets out at all this night. Having really nice flashlights, we were pursuing to push as far as we could. The part of the forest that we were descending down was a hill that eventually drops off to a steep canyon, which drops off again into a small river that flows around the area. During the daytime, the scenery and the sights are beauties in their own right, but during the night, it could be a death trap. As we're descending down to that point into the thickness of the forest, we hear branches breaking and the sounds of something big moving around just a little past us in the trees and brush. The time of year was not in our favor. Being springtime, everything has grown back, full and lush. You don't have a ton of visibility because of that. The kids and I halted, listening quietly. That's when the 13-year-old started panicking, thinking it was a mountain lion, but I kept trying to signal to him to be quiet and to listen. That's whenever it was stopped making noise. We stood there for a minute, thinking that whatever this supposed mountain lion was doing, that maybe it heard us and walked away. We didn't hear anything though, and had it left the area, we would have heard it trot off into the night. It was just quiet. I kept signaling to the others to slowly start to back away in case it was, and that's when we heard whatever it was start coming towards us in the trees. It sounded so much bigger than any mountain lion because each step it took was a heavy thud. That's when I started to grab the kids and swiftly retreat back up the hill we were coming down. We were all trying not to scream. It was an incredibly scary situation to be in and I think even the more experienced and tough men of the mountain would have been terrified. I turned around to hopefully or not hopefully, catch some sort of glimpse of whatever was moving in our direction towards us, and I see this big yellow glowing eyes higher up than I am. That's when I lost it, and just bolted it with the kids out of there. When I saw those eyes, that was enough for me. I never shined my light at them, they were just glowing up there in the trees. Luckily the kids never saw it, because they were busy running up the hill, thinking it was some big mountain lion. I know for a fact that it was for sure not a mountain lion. It was big, tall, and sounded like the weight of a great weight. Why it started aggressively approaching us, I have yet to know. I don't think it bothered to chase us up the hill or anything. When we got out of that thicker part of the forest and the land had flattened out, there was nothing behind us and no signs of anything following behind us. I didn't care. I just got us all back to the house and that was that. They were freaked out, telling their parents that we went out there and almost got eaten by a huge mountain lion. I played along and agreed, but I know it wasn't a mountain lion. It's probably for the best the kids never know it was either. I will never tell them that and risk scarring them for life, especially about those eyes. It was a scary experience and it's kept me out of that area at night. I was getting home with my brother from school when we saw a monster just off in the trees right by our house. I was frozen in my tracks and then my brother saw it too. We never saw this creature in full, but we saw this long snout and long claws holding onto the trees behind the branches, watching us. Then I got the feeling that it knew that we saw it because it started growling. My brother grabs my arm and motions to me that we need to go book it for the house. I was afraid that whatever this creature was was going to chase us, but we risked it anyway and we started taking off running. I have no idea if it was just a wild animal or something more sinister, but whatever it was, I knew I had to get home as quickly as possible. My brother and I ran up the hill towards our house. We didn't even make it to the top when we heard a loud noise next to us. This creature was following us closely in the trees. It was paralleling us perfectly and keeping up with us with no problems. 
We were so scared that we didn't even stop to think about what it could be. We just kept running to the front door until we finally got out of range of the creature's sight. We got in the house, slammed the door and locked it. We could hear a bunch of thrashing around in the trees next to the house and it went on for a while. My brother and I were scared. We weren't even sure what to do or who to call. Here we are, 12 and 14, and there's a friggin' monster in the trees next to our house. Our parents would never believe us. We hid in our bedrooms, waiting for our mom to get home. My brother and I grabbed the biggest knives we could find and hunkered down. Maybe 20 minutes later, and the noise finally began to die down. Then, it got dead silent outside. Because this was in January, the sun sets here at like 4.30, 5 o'clock in the evening time. So by now it was already dark. My mother got home first, closer to 5.45. And when she came in, she seemed to be spooked or bothered by something. We were nervous to say anything because we were still freaked and didn't want to say anything to her. But she obviously was bothered by something. She acted off because she usually greets us and asks us how our day was but she didn't this time. She walks right into the kitchen and gets on the phone with what we can discern was the police, talking quietly and looking out the window. My brother and I are standing on top of the stairwell, looking at each other with eyes as big as saucer plates. Something was going on, and in my 12-year-old mind, I was thinking that creature was still out there. My older brother was brave enough to actually go downstairs and ask her what was going on but she wouldn't answer the question and just reassured him everything was okay. He tells her, We saw it too, Mom, coming home from school. It was hiding there in the trees. And then I hear him just going off and off, telling her everything that we saw and everything that happened. I was boggled that she wouldn't just acknowledge what we had to say and just left the conversation and walked away. She had a glass of wine and ignored us the rest of the night. It was bizarre. My mother never acted that way. But this was years ago, and I don't know if what we saw had anything to do with that giant animal creature or what. That was a nightmare, and I hope to never relive that again. That's my strange experience. I don't know what we saw or what kind of animal it could have been. It's never been talked about in my family since. Is it possible that it could have been a dogman? I don't know since I don't really know anything about monsters or cryptids or any of that, but it certainly scared me and my brother to death, and I'm glad that we never encountered it again. I will tell you about the visual encounter that I had with what I believed to be a dogman. I used to have a bunch of thick woods around my old place, and I spent a lot of time hiking in them. I was kind of a loner anyway, so it worked out for me great. My first inkling was that I heard a deer, so I turned around to look, and I seen this creature's face peering at me through the trees. Let me lay the cards out for you here. If you've ever seen those werewolf movies where the creature looks half man, half wolf, short snout, but the face is still very human, that's exactly what I saw. This thing was my height, and it was peering at me through the trees, and I saw more of it than I wanted to see. As soon as I saw it, I flinched and screamed because it looked so horrific. Then it turned around and ran off through the trees. This wasn't far from my house either, maybe 500 feet at the very most, so this kind of shook me. This was just a calm spring afternoon in June, back in 88. I had no idea that an animal like that would ever be hanging out in my backyard in the woods. Literally zero idea. So I run back to my house, call my friend. I'm going crazy telling him over the phone you need to get over here. There's this crazy wolf looking monster out in the backyard of my woods. Let's go kill this son of a gun. He comes over 20 minutes later. We go out there and it's still light out. And he just starts heading out deep into the woods, far beyond where I'm at now. Now, I'm going to explain to you something. Where my house was at the time, it was still really new development. So once you backed into the woods, that was my house. There was a small hill you had to cross over, and then it dipped into a larger valley that would span a few more miles before you hit any more neighborhoods. This friend of mine runs back there, 
not even 15 minutes back there, and I hear him start firing off his revolver and screaming. He comes running back, white as a sheet, and tells me he saw the thing, fired multiple shots off at this creature, and it charged him, nearly slicing his belly open. Now I'm thinking, oh man, I gotta get the hell out of here. So he offers me his couch to sleep on while I figure all this stuff out. So, long story short, I ended up crashing out on his couch for a while, all the while trying to go back to my house during the day, packing up everything and selling what I could just to try and get rid of the damn house. I had lived there for six months before, and it was a very small one-bedroom house, mind you. I wasn't wanting to deal with it, so I just up and left the house permanently and left the area for good. Not one of my better moments that I'm particularly proud of, but I felt backed into a corner. When people are pushed into a corner like that, I mean, what are your options? I didn't feel safe. I did not feel comfortable going back there. I had been going back there four months at this point, and now all of a sudden, I'm having to deal with some unknown animal. I didn't even bother with the police, because that would have been a joke. They would accuse me of drinking and being a drunk. I didn't expect my friend to come over and charge back there like Arnold Schwarzenegger in the movie The Predator, but he wanted to check it out for himself, and I felt better having him by my side because he was an experienced, tanky kind of individual. You know, he's a big dude. He lifted weights, didn't take crap from anybody. He's still that way now, a very alpha male kind of personality, but now that he's older, he's got quite the bit of gray on his face. During this time, though, we were just both in our 20s, just fresh out of college. So the plot thickens even more. I moved out of the area, and then my friend begins calling me and telling me weird stuff is going on around that entire neighborhood. When I first moved in that neighborhood, houses were very sparse and far apart. Now in 2020, it's fully developed. I don't even think those backwoods are even there anymore because it's all houses in development now. He had other close friends in the neighborhood, but he kept tabs with me. It was a very close-knit kind of neighborhood. Everybody just kind of knew each other. The kind of neighborhood that when there's a big barbecue, everybody was invited. That's just how it was in the 80s. Not at all like nowadays where nobody talks to each other or can make eye contact. Anyway, word got around that people were seeing a strange animal sniffing around their garbage, trying to get into the back of their house so, the police started investigating, thinking there were robbers trying to get into the houses. But I guess they themselves had a few encounters with the same creature. A close friend of his was telling him that he would hear gunshots at night from the police. And then before you know it, a strong curfew was in place for that neighborhood, telling people not to go outside after 8pm. Just crazy stuff that you would only see out of a movie. Well, come to pass in about 4 months and it finally ended. But from June to October, this kind of stuff was going on. Cats and dogs would go missing. People would have sightings here and there. Real Hollywood kind of stuff. Even though the friend that I had helped me out didn't live in that neighborhood, he still kept his good old revolver close to him at all times, fully loaded. He was not a risk taker. At least not when it came to this kind of thing. I hope you enjoyed my story. I've only actually gotten to tell a handful of people about it, because so seldom few people even believe what I have to say. I've told a few other big YouTube channels now, so maybe my story is out there. But if not, and you choose to read this, I hope your readers enjoy it. Before I end this story, my friend and I are still doing well, and he is still tough as nails. We have both moved away from that area. He's now living down in Austin, Texas, and I live in Missouri currently. At the time, this was in central Pennsylvania, where all of this took place, back in 1988. The first encounter was when I was young and trying to fall asleep. I looked out the window and saw it, out towards the backyard and faced my window at the time. Nowadays, I sleep in the basement. Back on topic, my brother and I always felt nervous looking out the window. My bed perfectly faced the window at the time the beast was three feet away, looking into the window. It had yellow eyes, the long snout of a dog, black fur. Its face was kind of human, subtract the snout 
and the gnarly, long teeth, and fur all over its face. Once it realized I noticed it, it snarled at me quietly through the window, and it was a stare down. I slowly pulled the covers over my head. I then proceeded to cry for what felt like forever. Then, I ran into my parents' room crying, telling me it was just a dream. I thought that for what was like eight years until my sophomore year in high school when my brother, my friend and I were out fishing. My brother loved peanut butter at the time. He brought a plate with a giant serving sized spoon glob and some Ritz crackers. There's a creek back there, surprisingly some decent fish, mostly chub, but there is bullhead, carp, green bellied sunfish, crayfish and snapping turtles, brown trout, but that's really rare to catch there. We sometimes thought it'd be funny to throw the chub there and leave them there at our favorite spot. A giant fallen oak tree, which acts like a natural bridge across the creek it fell due to the amount of weight it was bearing that due to a bad snowstorm. My friend and I went downstream one summer's day. Meanwhile, my brother was fishing alone. He went to go take a leak. He left the food on the other side of the creek. When he came back, he saw it running off with. He described it as more of a Bigfoot. He ran to us hysterical. We just thought he was crazy, so we started calling him Crazy Joey. After that, I thought of my run-in with something similar at the young age and the stare down. Later, my friend was busy with lawn work and prepping to move. I was secretly afraid to go out. Joe decided to come back there a month later. He left by himself. I wish I could have saw to confirm my story, but the second time around I believed him for sure. He was catching some fish, his line was all screwed up, and took it off his fishing and re-spooled it, and he ran and came because he only had one hook on the pole. He ran back and claimed that he had the same thing, chasing the bird that was wrapped up. He yelled and scared it, then ran back home for a knife as fast as he can, then cut it free. I seen something similar to my sighting. My brother, my friend and some others were going to fish at a legal spot we didn't know it was private property at the time. Whenever me and my friends try out new spots, we have the tradition of casting bass lures first and then using normal live bait. I wanted to hesitate because the fish were biting there pretty good at the creek. So, sure enough, they went ahead of me across the oak tree towards the quarry. I felt alone after 12 minutes. Then I took my bag, two poles, and the tackle I was changing out close to the log. I started walking and saw what I thought to be a big gray wolf easily waste me being around 5'6". In Illinois, anything's possible. My friend got cornered by four coyotes out there once, but sure enough, the creature by another giant oak tree and I made eye contact again. Another stare down, only different since it was on all fours. It was obviously interested in my friend since it was following the trail that leads there. I yelled and chased it off. The look on its face was playful because it was probably pretending not to notice me, so I chased it to the clearing. The retention ponds are on the left and a small prairie on the right. It seemingly went towards the prairie. Sure enough, I quickly forgot when one of my friends caught a big large mouth bass that weighed three and a half pounds in the first cast. I waited until we were going to leave to inform them because I didn't want to ruin the fact we were catching bass on every cast. But the guard working there gave us a warning and told us to get out of there, and this private property, etc. I told them and they didn't believe me. The last time we saw something similar, me and my brother were scavenging for roadkill when we saw a black dog. Maybe it looked at us, ran away constantly, back it moved gracefully through the brush. Meanwhile, me and my brother were absolutely getting torn up by the raspberry bushes. We catch up, it waits, and then runs away again. We played this game five times with that thing, then we couldn't find it again. I live in Roscoe, enjoy being outside. I notice strange things out in the woods. People usually just kick the roadkill off the highway. It can cause an issue if it's big enough like a deer. But I notice some things went out of its way to drag them out of the prairie. Coyotes, maybe. That thing is sure, why not? There's plenty of deer, turkey, rabbits. You can even hear the coyotes get excited when they catch a poor rabbit at night. April 1999. For some background info, I was raised in the deserts, southeast of New Mexico, 
on two different ranches, so I am very well versed in the flora and fauna of our beautiful state. I even used to track semi-professionally for hunters and our local trapper. I know the critters around this state. We have always lived on very remote ranches, 50, sometimes 70 miles from the nearest actual town. My senior year of high school, I moved out of my own, being a part of the DECA program to live closer to my job and school, living about 12 miles from a small New Mexico town where my school and job were. Seemed like living right in town after all of that. I guess my story starts in April of 1999. My boyfriend and I were rooming with a couple in a trailer house just outside of Lakewood, New Mexico. We rented a room from them and sometimes watched their two kids as a part of our rental agreement. For a few weeks that April, a lot of the neighboring landowners had been complaining about wild dogs coming up from the river and harassing their dogs and scaring their livestock. We were about a mile from the Pecos River, and wild dogs have indeed been a problem in the area. One guy had even reported seeing some structural damage to one of his chicken coops. The couple we lived with had two dogs, both of them medium-sized terrier mixes, and neither one of them were on the cowardly side. They had been getting very skittish about going outside at night, though. So much so that we had to make sure to let them out right at sunset and again at sunrise because they would not leave the trailer house that night otherwise. On Saturday night, at about 11 p.m., I know it was a Saturday because I had neither work or school. Near the end of the month, the four of us were sitting around watching TV and just basically talking about stuff when the dogs, who were asleep in the master bedroom on the far east side of the house, started growling and barking at the window on the south wall of the bedroom. This was really unusual behavior for them, so we all got up to see what they were on about. By the time we got there, the dogs had shifted their barking away from the window and seemed to be barking at the wall and along the wall like they could smell something there, but it was moving. It was very strange, and when they came up to the end of the room, their barking just went crazy. Suddenly, from farther down the wall, at the same time, about where the kitchen was, we all heard this loud thump and scuffling sound. It was powerful enough that we actually felt it, with it being an 80 by 16 trailer house and all. The dogs at this point just completely lost it. They cried out a high-pitched whine and just dove under the bed. We all ran out of the bedroom down the hall and into the kitchen to see what the heck was up. Peering out of the kitchen window was pointless as it was late. There was cloud cover and the moon wasn't even out. We heard the scuffling noise again and further down the house and went into the living room to see what was up. We were all really confused at this point. The next few moments seemed to happen in slow motion, appearing in the living room window from the left and looking right into us from the glass was, I don't know what. From the shoulders up was what I can only describe as a man-dog. Its shoulders were quite human, with short, sleek hair, but the head what looked to be that of a Rottweiler. And the teeth, oh my, the teeth on this thing. All four of us screamed at about the same time, and I guess that scared it off, because it just disappeared. That image, though, is forever seared into my head. Also of note, this was a trailer house, so the bottom of that window was easily six foot off the ground, meaning this thing was seven foot something. No matter how big of a dog or wolf it was, it could not have stood up and looked at us like that in the window. The guys, being guys, immediately grabbed their shotguns and headed out the door, even though I told them it was a bad idea. Super dark desert, right? Big unknown critter? No. I guess they were out there looking for it for like 20 minutes before they came back inside and said they could not see a thing. The light from the house shining on it, and it being so close to the window, were the only reasons we saw it in the first place. None of us really slept well that night. It just felt super creepy. The next morning, I got up early and decided to go have a look around, to see if there were any tracks to identify what it was. The grass and weeds that were right beside the house pretty much hid any tracks it made there although I did find where it looked as if something had clawed at the sliding along the bottom of the house in a couple of places, making the thump and scuffling sounds the night before. 
I then decided to follow the tracks the guys had made, and that was when I made a second, very unnerving discovery. The guys made clear tracks in the sandy dirt, and whatever it was out there did well, because it was pretty much circling them the entire time they were out there, at a distance of about 40 feet. The tracks were huge, canine, and switched back and forth from four tracks to two, meaning it was walking bipedally for at least half the time it circled them. Just creepy. My dad and mom had taken my little brother and sister to Tucson to do something for the day. We lived in a trailer in a rural area outside of Sierra Vista. We had two horses, two dogs, a cow, and chickens on a small amount of land that we had. As the oldest son and being 17, it was my job to feed and take care of them. On the night in question, it was a stormy monsoon rain with thunder and lightning going on. But, like monsoons can be, they rage and then settle into a lull, and rage again. I was getting ready to settle down and watch a good movie, when all of a sudden, my two dogs started barking and wouldn't shut up. When I told them to calm down, in the previous week or so before that, my dogs had been acting up and barking a lot at night. I attributed this to coyotes that I had heard and howling in just the night time. So I got my dad's 30-30 and just one bullet, in case I had to shoot to scare off the coyote or kill it if rabid. I rested the loaded rifle near the wall by the back door and turned on the floodlights just outside the trailer. The rain had just now stopped, so I looked out by the window near the front door and saw two of our horses and cows staring as if through the front door to the back door of the trailer where the dogs were barking I thought, maybe they're scared of the coyotes. So I grabbed the rifle and opened up the back door. As I was getting near the back door, I heard my dogs whimpering and crying. Now I was thinking, is it, could it be a pack of coyotes? So I put a few bullets in my pocket, figuring I could load them if I didn't like what I saw. I opened the door and the darndest thing happened. My two dogs beeline rush past me to the center of the trailer and hunker down in the kitchen. Mud is everywhere on the floor, from their paws, and now I'm pissed because I have to clean it up. So I close the door and go to try to get my dogs to get out, but they wouldn't budge and squirmed out of my arms when I tried to grab them. They were terrified. Now I was mad at the coyotes and grabbed the rifle to go run them off or kill them. The trailer sits on a foundation of blocks the front and back doors are accessible by a set of small stairs. I'm 5'6", by the way. I opened the back door and was looking out in the darkness at that point. I was about to step out when I saw a set of eyes looking back at me out of the darkness. From the top of my head in the trailer to the ground is around 7 plus feet or so. And here is a set of eyes looking at me, level and square on. I'm like, darn... Coyote must be on the small gravel hill we used to pave the road, or it's a bird on a mesquite bush. But I was thinking to myself, that monsoon was awfully bad and rained hard. What kind of bird would hunker down on a mesquite bush, and why would a coyote be out in a downpour? So I'm raising my rifle and drawing a bead on the eyes, when lightning lights up the night. All of a sudden, the lightning illuminates the small gravel hill. That's like six feet high and the surrounding mesquite bushes. The light winks out as fast as it appeared. From the lightning though, there was nothing on the gravel hill and no bird of any on the mesquite bushes. Then it dawned on me. Whatever it was, it was very tall and was still staring at me. A sense of dread crept over me all of a sudden as I realized that the 3030 only had one measly bullet and if I missed, there was no way I'd be able to reload before it was on me. I kept the gun pointed at it as I quickly closed the door. I locked the door, realizing this trailer would never withstand whatever it was out there if it attacked. I locked the front door and turned on all the lights in the house. I grabbed the bullets of the 30 6 and 22 rifle, then go into the kitchen with the dogs and I loaded each rifle full on. I hugged my dogs and prayed that whatever it was went away and did not attack. 
I stayed awake the whole night until my parents got back. My dad was furious that the lights were on, but my dad checked outside for coyotes, but whatever it was, was gone. I grew up in a town called Hawthorne, located in Nevada. Hawthorne is located right next to Walker Lake. The main highway leading from Hawthorne to Reno is Highway 95, which, if you use Google Earth or Google Maps, you can see runs right between Walker Lake and a mountain range. This creates a small area of highway that is affectionately known to the locals as the Cliffs. When I was 14, my grandparents, mom, and I were coming home late from a long day of doctor's appointments in Reno. My grandfather was driving, and we hit the cliffs a little after 11.30 p.m. I was in the passenger seat to help keep my grandfather awake, but I still just think it was so I would sing him folk songs. Anyway, about a third of the way around the cliffs, heading toward Hawthorne, there is a small area where the road pulls away from the mountain and creates a small outcove area. As we started to come up on it, we saw a large animal crossing the road, dragging another animal in its mouth, and it stopped in this outcove. Grandpa thought at first that I might get my first look at a live mountain lion, so he slowed down. When we got within 100 feet of it, he turned on the brights of the car. To our surprise, it was no mountain lion. We only had a couple of seconds to look at it, after Grandpa turned on the brights, because right after the light hit, whatever it was, it turned to look at us one second, and the next, it leapt straight up the side of the mountain and out of sight, leaving the mangled body of a fox. Grandfather hit the gas and the old Buick we were in jumped, waking up the woman in the back seat. I had never seen my grandfather truly scared before, but even he was physically shaking afterward. I remember the sheer bulk of the thing and the fact that it looked like a really large bodybuilder when it jumped in the same fashion as a human with its arms reaching up toward the rocks almost over its head. It had long thick fur, but you could see the muscle definition. I don't remember the facial features, but I remember the pure terror when that thing turned and looked at the car with shining yellow eyes. I even pissed myself. I have come practically face to face with a polar bear and I wasn't as scared as when we saw this thing. Now, I don't believe in werewolves, and I haven't seen anything like it since, but I hope I never do again. On August 27th, 2016, my 10-year-old grandson was sitting in a car at a restaurant parking lot. This occurred in San Francisco, California. He was waiting for his paternal grandmother. Across the street from him, on a sidewalk, he noticed a large creature, which I determined to be a seven to eight foot tall, from talking with him. It was walking on two legs towards a wooded area at the end of a sidewalk and disappeared into some brush. The creature did not appear concerned about my grandson, as it was in no hurry. When I asked him about what he had seen, he described a classic canine type dogman with red eyes. His distance from this creature was around 30 feet. Dolly City is a semi-rural with many pockets of woodlands and some tracts of forest here and there. The area where he saw the creature has paved roads and sidewalks ringed with areas of trees. This occurred in 1953. The encounter I'd like to share is not my own, but that of my mother. She used to tell me stories when I was young about strange things that she had experienced in her lifetime. I remember this dogman type of encounter. There's not particularly a lot of detail to this encounter, but what you might find interesting is the location. The sighting took place in Sacramento, California, around 1953, not too far from our state's capital. Using Google Maps to get an approximate location and lay of the land, I can see the sighting area was about 1,000 feet to the west and perpendicular to the American River. Across the river from the east bank, it's only about another 2,000 feet east to the state capital. So, this took place fairly close to a heavily populated area. My mother states, when she was about 12 years old, she was lying on the couch, watching TV. That's when she noticed a scary dog face looking at her, 
through a low pane window. The window was on either side by the door. I am unclear of this fact. In any event, the head, she said, must have been about two to two and a half feet above the ground. She covered her face in fright with her pillow. After a minute or so, she snuck a peek, figuring she just might be imagining things. She sought and was gone, and felt a little better. Then she noticed it was now looking through another higher window. Its head was now about four to four and a half feet above the ground, according to her recollection. There was nothing outside that window for a dog to stand on. At that point, she just ran to another room in terror. She doesn't really recall what happened after that. She describes the animal as being dark gray, with glowing red eyes, seemingly panting or baring its teeth. She didn't see the body, but had the impression that it was thin. Unfortunately, she doesn't recall the time of day, month, or season. My parents tell me there's likely some American Indian burial grounds in the area, as there have been excavations near the river, which yielded Native American arrowheads and other artifacts. I know it's been mentioned in some of the encounters, a proximity to rivers and Native American burial grounds. I even asked my mother if there was cornfields in the area, since that has been mentioned in the encounters before. She said only a small patch of corn stalks in their own backyard. I don't think that qualifies. The area around my grandparents' house was not really wooded. The neighborhood was mostly large fields with a few horses and some cattle. The areas around the river is wooded now, and though was probably a lot more so in 1953 than it is today. Another paranormal story about this area is that on Monster Quest episode detailing the Mothman, someone supposedly was taking dusk or night shot pictures of the Tower Bridge in 2009 and saw a flying humanoid shape or something fly off a bridge. The Tower Bridge is in the 1,000 foot range from my grandparents' house. Spooky. And that's all there really is. This happened in March of 2017. It was 2.30 a.m. and another night of not being able to sleep due to back pain. I was lying on my side reading when my very close by neighbor's motion detector light turned on. This does happen from time to time. When it turns on, it lights up the entire side of my house. We have lived here nine years and I have never once seen anything walk past my bedroom window at night. Since I was facing my large bedroom window, the very bright motion detector light going off caught my attention. I looked up and saw the side silhouette of a dogman. I exclaimed. It was walking past my bedroom window. I saw it from mid shoulders up. The shoulders were huge and its head was huge. It had pointed ears like a German Shepherd dog and a long snout. Its mouth was slightly open, as I saw a large tongue that seemed to be lolling to the side of its mouth. When I saw this creature and spoke those words, I could swear that the thing slowed down, smirked, and then kept on going. That's all I saw that night. Last week though, while in my bedroom again, I heard something huge land on the ground behind my bedroom wall. That wall has no windows. I heard a deep, raspy kind of breathing. I started praying, pleading the blood of Jesus over my house, grounds around it and all. I do this most nights, but sometimes I forget. I'm awake most nights until 3 a.m. or later due to having severe spinal issues as well as fibromyalgia. We live in a lovely manufactured home community. There are lots of trees around here, and it's very close to canals large open fields and woods. I know this is what I saw, but the fact that I saw it has left me amazed. Why is it that when so many are also seeing them? I guess I just thought since I'm in the house most of the time due to my health, I would never see them. The space between my neighbor's house and ours is about 10 feet. My husband went outside weeks later, once I got the courage to tell him that this had happened and measured the area by the window that dogman had to be at least eight feet tall. What concerns me greatly is that no one in the police department or government will alert people to their existence. People are walking around feeling a false sense of security. I know I did. I won't even try to walk outside anymore. And yes, I have cautioned my neighbors, the ones with the security light. 
I can't think of any other details right now, but it's important for you to know that several years ago, a homeless woman was camping out down by the river here in Albany, Oregon. She was found dead and her tent was torn up. I believe the police report in the newspaper said she was torn up as well, but I honestly can't remember any of the details. To the best of my knowledge, no one was ever caught for that crime. This is a sleepy town, just over 50,000 people here in Lynn County. We no longer get the newspaper, so I have no idea if this happened again. I do know that a couple was down by that same area and saw a dogman. It really frightened them badly. I heard about that on another YouTube channel, so I just want people to be aware so they don't go out at night anymore, especially near the river. But then, we're not near a river, and I saw one in the middle of the night. I was 13 at the time, and we lived in Ohio. My dad was outside, fixing up his old tool shed when we both started to hear a low growl come just from beyond the trees. I was in my bedroom at the time, playing video games, and I had my window open. I could hear my dad outside working, since he was right there in plain view. It was a beautiful sunny morning, so I enjoyed the cool breeze coming in. But the issue with my window being open is that it was always a pain trying to get it to close. It would somehow get stuck. Anyway, I heard the low rumble growl too, and I looked out the window and saw something that scared me more than anything else I'd ever seen. A wolf, about seven to eight feet tall, with a thick body, covered in grayish white fur, standing on two legs like it was a human. This creature was huge and was walking upright, just like a person does. I saw it had five big claws on its front paws, and some on each of its hind legs. It looked like this thing had human hands with claws on them. The thing was creeping closer and closer to my father from beyond the tree's visibility point behind the shed. It just stood there looking around and sniffing as if it were following the scent trail to where my father was. I was frozen in absolute horror and I watched as it began closely watching my dad, observing him like a prey just before pouncing. I screamed out the window because it was open and that there was a monster in the trees. My dad looks and sees what I'm screaming at and sees this thing. Then he bolts into the house. He races, locking the door. Then he runs into my room and tries the best he can to close my window, but can't get it to budge. As he's trying to get it shut the best he can, but the thing always gets stuck. This werewolf looking animal is now walking and approaching the house right where we're at. My dad and I, in fear, fall backward and huddle in the corner together, unsure of what this approaching creature will do, our eyes fixed on it as it slowly begins approaching. It opens its mouth and snarls, very loud. It was very disturbing. It appeared to be very upset that we were in the room, or so I sensed. It then bares its teeth at us and makes a very sinister looking grin on its face, like it wanted to hurt us. My dad didn't own any weapons during this time, so he pulled me into the back room that was my bedroom and into the bathroom and locked the door. The werewolf, or whatever this thing was, growled and snarled around the house a bit more. Then it stopped. My dad slowly opens the door and checks to see if the creature was gone, but he couldn't see it anywhere. He kept looking and looking, and there was no trace of it. It took a little while before he felt brave enough to step outside to truly check if this thing really was gone. He went from room to room, opening all the windows to see and peer outside. It was probably hours before he felt comfortable going out to his shed again. It boggled my mind. You think after an experience like that, you wouldn't be stepping foot outside again. But not my dad, he just brushed it off. This happened about 11 in the morning, on a bright sunny day. 
Whatever creature this was had no problem showing itself to us and scarred my father and I for life. I've never, ever seen a beast so large as the creature that we saw that day. He said he was going to tell his friend, a very experienced hunter, about it. Well, he called him, but to no avail. A week passed and my dad's friend still had not returned my father's phone call. Maybe the thought of a wolf standing up on two legs was too much for him. It couldn't have been a werewolf because I don't believe that werewolves exist, but this defied every act of logic. I've heard stories of werewolves and maybe even vampires, but I'd never seen one myself. Maybe this really was a werewolf. If that's the case, what's stopping vampires and other creatures of the night from existing? That's what I'd like to know. Oh, and to give some more context, my dad was a single dad at the time. It was just me and him living in this tiny two-bedroom house. My mother and him had split when I was really little, and so I'd frequently go back and forth between spending time at both their houses. I don't really have many happy memories of my childhood, but those times when I stayed with my father, they were good. Well, besides this time, of course. I saw a massive upright walking black wolf on two legs, walking across the road the other night. It was huge and had a long tail dragging behind it. I thought at first that it must be some kind of mythical creature. It was about 8 feet tall, I'm guessing, and had long fur, kind of like a bear, but much darker. Very shaggy and unkempt looking. It startled me the second I saw it, and I had to slam on my brakes in hopes of not hitting this thing. It darted across the road quickly and paid no attention to my oncoming vehicle. I could only stare at it as it ran up to a tree and jumped up topwards to the top of the tree. Once it jumped up into the tree, it was gone. I don't think my jaw has ever felt open that big before. When I say to you just how big this creature was, I mean this creature was so large, taller than I am, and I'm 6'4". This thing had a broad chest, like it had been lifting weights, and a large head that looked disproportionate to its body, but it looked just like a wolf's head. Its legs were like those of a world champion weightlifter giant, rippling muscles coursing underneath its skin. This thing was a true behemoth of a creature. I just couldn't stop staring up at it in the tree in complete and utter awe. It took me about an extra 10 minutes to drive myself home that night, because I just couldn't fathom what I had seen that darted across the road in front of me. This occurred on August 7th, 2020, just outside of Colorado Springs, Colorado. It was already dark, and it ran about 20 to 30 feet in front of my car. Trust me when I say I got more of a look at it than I really bargained for. This was the night that I saw a real-life living monster. The next morning, when I told some of my friends what I had seen, they just kind of looked at me as if I was insane. I mean, I get it. I guess I'm a little nuts after all, but I know I'm not crazy. Not enough to make this up. I wasn't sleep deprived. I was completely sober. I know what I saw, and I will continue to share my experiences with people who are willing to listen. I know this all sounds pretty whacked out. But I'm serious when I say I saw what I saw. It was no dream. I'm just glad I could find a safe haven to submit my encounter like this and to be believed and not be laughed at or mocked, as most people would. I'll forever drive more cautiously at night now because of this. I hope my experience can help somebody else in the future to be brave enough to share theirs. I know enough about cryptozoology to know that what I saw was a skinny, wolf-looking creature that walked on two legs about a month ago in a large open field coming towards the highway. I happened to look over the moment that I was driving by, and I saw movement that caught my eye, and I saw this creature barreling towards the road in front of me. I gasp because I'm in shock at what I'm seeing, and then it quickly ducked down into the tall grass and I never saw it again after that. I'm a very novice crypto researcher, 
and only have a very elementary grasp on what a dogman truly is. I never thought I would actually see it in person, let alone get as close to it as I got. I drove right past where it ducked down into the tall grass. I am not sure if it was trying to hide or what it was doing. In any case, I didn't stop to see if it was still there and didn't want to drive all the way back around. I kept driving because, to be honest with you, it freaked me out. Sure, I find cryptids fascinating, but that doesn't mean I want to be up close and personal to one. I almost wonder if it didn't know my car was coming and was already out running towards the road. My car came around a heavily wooded bend in the area, around this field, and then it tried to fully conceal itself the best it could in the grass. It was gone, just like that, like it never even existed. I had to blink and think about what I just saw. It's like my brain couldn't wrap around the fact that this was real, that my encounter with it was not just a really bad nightmare that I wish would end. It looked just like a wolfman. No, not from the movies, but a wolf-looking human creature. I don't know too much about what a dogman truly is and what I saw was what I believed to be one in the flesh. I'm not sure why it came out into the open like that, but I do know that they are much faster than what I witnessed when it ducked down. I'm glad I got to see it up close. It's just too bad I don't have any knowledge on what it truly is or what it was doing out there. I would think somebody who's more versed in dogmen would know something, and maybe they've had several encounters with these same creatures I have. Anyway, this is where my story ends. Once I drove to the other end of the field, I didn't see it anymore since it had ducked down entirely and was now hidden away from view. This was in the evening time. There was still plenty of light outside, but the sun was starting to set. I didn't see it again for the rest of the evening or night, but I kept my eyes open on the large grassy field and the trees around it, kind of hoping that it would eventually pop up again. No such luck. The night went on and no more dogmen popped out on the road or next to it. My family comes from the southwestern area of the United States. We're not full-blooded Latino, but a lot of us are. The town in which my parents come from in New Mexico is prone to all sorts of weird sightings of shapes moving underneath the sand, lights in the skies, people being abducted, horned, upright walking beasts attacking people, people going missing, all sorts of crazy stuff that you would not believe normally. This is an area also full of Native American legends and lore. Even many of the native people in the area talk about the dangers of living out there, and not just from the increasingly rising temperatures in the desert or the venom of a rattlesnake, but the beings that are said to lurk underneath the sand. Anyway, it all dates back to the 1940s when my grandparents, before giving birth to my father, purchased land in the area and built a large house to live in, a little way outside of any real civilization. They owned and operated a bunch of cattle farming for years and years. They overdid it in the first few years and then running it, and were going through ranch helpers like crazy, I guess. People would come on board to help, but get spooked at all the stuff going on out there. Kids as young as 14 and 15 getting hired on to help. Some of them would flat out go missing, while others would report seeing strange tall beings approaching them through the pastures. Others talked about massive black beasts that would come out of the sand and come for them. Just crazy stuff, am I right? I can never get my grandfather to tell me too much about this stuff because he was just a stubborn old man. May his soul rest in peace. My father was the one that opened up about it and told me everything I needed to know. He told me growing up that it was just a part of business as usual. Sometimes, if not most of the time, he felt rattlesnakes were the least of his worries with all the bizarre sightings and happenings that were going on down there. Growing up in those conditions, it makes you a pretty tough individual. I'm not going to lie. He's a strong man, enlisted in the army later on, and even served in Vietnam. Now, he runs a mechanic shop full time 
and works on old cars. He is a very straight to the point kind of person and absolutely cannot stand it when you beat around the bush with something. He is the last person I'd ever expect to come up with a wild story filled with lies and fairy tales. So, when he began telling me about the things that were going on on the land that his father and mother purchased and built on, was hair raising to say the least. He claims it was every day that they saw something go on. The things I mentioned to you at the beginning, the horned beasts, the creatures coming out of the sand, all of that, they would see this stuff go on non-stop. My father just grew so immune to the whole thing that he learned to live with it. They weren't losing cattle, and they weren't being hurt in any way, at least to an extent, and at least the family. As he told me, they were having ranch hands disappear left and right, while others would leave fleeing. That was when my father was just a little boy. They eventually had to hire out of town and even state to get some full-timers who were brave enough and paid enough to endure. There were a few ranch hands that reported being called out far into the desert night, like they were under some sort of spell or trance, and then wake up. Others reported being heavily watched during the day and night, so much so that they did not feel safe doing their job, like they had a sense of doom that continuously loomed over them. Much of all the crazy things that happened was what he believed was due to the natives and the magic they practiced on the land, long before they ever built the house and purchased the land. The land and all around the area was said to be cursed. They had apparently told his father that when he bought it, which by the way he got that huge segment of land for extremely cheap, even back in the 40s it was dirt cheap. My grandfather didn't have a lot of money and he couldn't refuse the offer. With his leftover money, he decided to then build the house and the ranch that would accompany it. He would tell me all sorts of stuff that he saw growing up and horrible things that went on. They did eventually lose some cattle over the course of the years, but not a lot. The cattle they did lose either vanished entirely, just like some of the ranch hands did, or were found with parts of their organs missing, or torn into pieces, looking like they fell into a wood chipper. At night, you would hear all sorts of howling, shuffling noises. Sometimes, my dad would tell me about hearing a giant herd of bulls were full on stampeding towards the house, only to look outside and not see a thing. He would see horned figures off in the distance, watching him at night, just before it got completely dark out. He witnessed large beasts of the earth, as he called them. Climbing out of the sand, as if below the sand, lied a giant pit. Finding dead rattlesnakes all over, that appeared to die for no apparent reason. Many strange occurrences just like these constantly. That's not even counting all the strange things you would hear, smell, or see off in the distance. He's so casual when he talks about it now because he just grew up around it. He's told me these stories for years, and over time, he's eventually given me more and more details, especially with the natives' curse and whatnot. How the land was cursed before it was bought, and his take on all of it was there's a strong sense of dark native magic that looms over the entire area, not just the property. That is what he believes is solely responsible for everything. Even his dad grew pretty numb to all the sightings and weird happenings, pretty emotionless to say the least. For the first five to 10 years, his management of livestock and the ranch were extremely poor. So when things like dead animals would happen or missing ranch hands, he wouldn't say anything to anybody. At first, many of the ranch hands he tried to bring on were vagabonds or people who didn't have much of anything. They weren't known throughout the community and were cheap hands to bring on board. Nobody really ever realized they were missing. And back in the 1940s, this kind of thing happened far more than you realize it did. Years back, I did get a chance to go back and visit grandfather's old land and house when it was currently vacant at the time. My father took me and warned me ahead of time that we're probably going to see, smell, or hear weird things, and that it's important to stay grounded. Having not grown up in it, the things I would experience might disturb me, and I needed to be ready for it, 
psychologically. He didn't want me walking away from this experience traumatized at all. I told him I could handle anything, so we went. I hadn't been to my grandfather's house and ranch since I was little, so my memories were pretty vague. But pulling up on the place, it was just like how I did remember it, even if it was only a little. It hadn't been updated much since the time it was built, other than the bare necessities. My grandfather was kind of a cheapskate. We arrived in the evening time, and the entire place just had this feeling that I can't quite capture into words. It was startling, like anything could happen at any given moment. You felt on edge, ready for something bad to happen, like you didn't want to sit still for very long. I didn't see anything crazy, but I would occasionally get a big waft of rotting flesh or raw sewage or both. My dad would smell it too and told me we shouldn't take too much time here. The fact we're here is known and we need to not take long. Keep in mind this place had been vacant for years and years. Nobody had been around. There is absolutely no reason why we should have smelt either of those things. I asked him about the source of the rotting flesh and sewage that seemed to come and go, but like I said, there were no understandably reliable sources of either of them. We didn't hang out there too long before the feeling of being uncomfortable grew and grew too much till we decided it was best to leave this place far behind. Visiting that whole area just had a feeling to it, an unmistakable feeling, like you're not supposed to be there, like you do not belong. Many natives don't even inhabit that area, and they say it's not safe. I didn't notice this, but we were there, and my dad spent about five minutes looking around. Oh, I did not go with him when he found several dead rattlesnakes lying on the ground. No signs of how they died. That is very unusual, and it just acted as a reminder for all the weird things he grew up hardened to living out there at that place. As I said, the energy is just so strange and I've never been somewhere and felt an energy quite like that. It's like it was so thick in the air, you can almost taste it with your mouth. It's not quite electricity, but there's just something sitting in the air. It's a feeling like you know something's coming, a bad storm. I was lucky, however. I didn't have to experience any of what my dad did growing up. His business was already booming so we had it pretty well off, and I grew up in a different state because as my dad got older, he eventually moved far away and out of state, running his own auto shop on the east coast where business was booming for him. The house, ranch, and all there is there today was sold many years ago, long after our visit there. I don't know the family that owns it or operates it now, but I guarantee the sightings of all the strange things that happened when my father was growing up still exists and currently goes on. I feel sorry for anybody that goes into that area or that currently owns that whole operation. I wish them the best of luck and hope they don't deal with anything like my grandfather and father did. I can't help but feel doubtful about all of it. If that land is truly cursed and even maybe some of the natives won't venture around there, then they will no doubt not last very long. Who knows what kind of true dark magic and rituals took place on the land years and years before my grandfather ever built on it.